my pleasure to announce that who am the young giant of Major Group theory who will tell us about what the Spanish we've done in the group groups. Right. So, hey, so the point today is that I think it really would be sort of part of the what I'm usually doing. And I'll kind of jump to the punchline as it's going. So, kind of the you know, main interesting thing that, that we'll do today is that everything will end up boiling down to some purely good theoretical level. And the magic trick is that we only know how to prove this purely good theoretic thing using descriptive stuff here. And then afterwards, we'll pull it back with some actual descriptive thing at the very end. So maybe you know, keep the sort of groupy people interested at the start when we're doing VSD stuff. Uh, keep that in mind, and I'm not lying to you saying so it'll be fun. Anyway, so the topic today is going to be to talk about ends of graphs. So, this is the definition for the ends of a graph that only works for locally finite graphs, but that'll be fine. That's all we'll care about today. So, a graph is going to have n ends. If I can find a finite set and I would, and the leftover graph has at most n infinite connected components left over, and moreover, that's the maximum you can do. So, for example, any z line is going to have two ends because if I kill some finite sets, well, maybe I should cut off some finite components, but there's exactly two infinite components that will be left over, and I can't get any more than two infinite components. On the other hand, something like a big z ring will be one ended because no matter what finite set I kill from this graph, well, I'll have the stuff inside, and maybe there's some finite holes or something left over. But I'll have at most one infinite component on the outside. So, a couple of classical things that we know about ends of graphs uh, is that if I have an infinite finitely generated amino group, then this thing has to have one or two ends. I'll forget about the silly zero end groups. These are finite. I don't want to care about them today. And some result of Holland from the 60s said that every countable connected graph has an end equal span tree. But it's, it has a spanning tree that happens to preserve the end structure of the graph itself. So it was a nice conjecture in infinite combinatorics that it should be true for not comfortable graphs, but there was a counterexample. Uh, but today we'll be interested in countable graphs. And the natural question, at least for people like this uh, workshop, is whether there's any definable versions of Holland's theorem. So whether we can prove the same thing but sit the word measurable everywhere or something like that. So of course, proving things about spanning trees is in general hard. So we'll focus mostly on the immutable case where it is easy to find at least spanning trees. And in the PMP case in particular, we know at least a little bit about the problem. So well, now we have graphs that aren't connected. So what does a spanning tree mean? And for the day, a spanning tree is going to mean a component spanning tree. That is, it will be some fourth of my world graph, and the fourth has to generate the same connectedness relation as my original graph. So if I have one connected component of my graph, that really <laughs> then my forest has to completely span this component. I can't have two pieces of the forest spanning a single component, and so on and so forth. And so another classical result that you would have seen at the tutorial session if you were here last week is that every paper finite PMP graph has a spanning tree with that moves two ends almost everywhere. So in particular, the only interesting case to worry about for paper finite PMP graphs is whether or not every one-ended paper finite PMP graph has a one-ended spanning tree or not. And this is a result of uh, independently by TMR and a bunch of people here. That this should be true. So TMR did the uh, well. TMR basically proved the same thing, not with this language, but it was you know as far as I know independently using all of these people. And the results are that every one-ended paper finite P and D graph has a row one-ended spanning tree almost everywhere. Where of course it's almost everywhere, it just means that I can throw out finitely many components in the left and right thing towards this. So let me at least. A tiny bit sketch the proof of this. So by the first fact that I mentioned up here, I know that my spanning tree that I get from enter finite s has one or two ends almost everywhere. If in a component I'm already one-ended, then I don't have to do anything. That's super nice. Otherwise, I have some two-ended components, and a two-ended uh, spanning tree of a one-ended graph is some sort of big Hilbert curvy sort of thing. And you can start looking for shortcuts in this and do some sort of sniffing algorithm to make this look more and more one ended. 
So using the two index spanning tree in different types of finite nets, we can do some combinatorics and get down to the one index spanning tree. And the natural question is, can we do something similar, but if we drop the PMG condition? So does every hint define a Borel graph? Then we're going to Borel and a for spanning tree on the secret graph. And there's a couple of issues with it. Well, first I'll mention that this is still only interesting in the one ended case. If I'm two ended, then I can kind of build by hand the two ended spanning tree without that on a wheel. And if I'm infinitely ended, then any of my spanning trees automatically have infinitely many ends. So I don't really have to do anything. So again, the one ended case is the thing we're kind of interested in. And the issues with extending the proof that I, you know, very detailedly told you just now is that I can now have infinitely ended spanning trees that come from my hyperfinite nest. My hyperfinite nest no longer guarantees me a spanning tree with one or two ends. So there's a tiny bit of hope that you can extend that proof uh, just by using the fact that in a measurable way, I can select one or two ends from any of my spanning trees. But I have absolutely no idea how to make use of this fact to get to a one end of standard. So if someone has some idea about how to do that, I'd love to hear it, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, so, so Matt, yeah, uh, maybe you already said this and I wasn't answering. Why, why is the infinite ended case not interesting here? Well, the infinite ended case, so if I have a spanning tree of an infinite ended graph, uh -huh. then it automatically has infinite ends. I can't have like a two ended spanning tree of an infinite graph. Because that would contradict the fact that the graph is too ended. But are you worried that it like uh, like, uh, like splits ends? Does that can I have that So end case pool for me just means that it has the same number of ends. Okay. I guess you could conceivably ask a more detailed question where I wanted to preserve the end relation or something. Yeah. And maybe that is a little bit interesting, but I have no other. I just was thinking about I want the spanning tree with the same number of ends, and that's as far as I want. But anyway, even in the just one ended case, I don't know how to solve this problem in general. But our result with myself and Juan and Jenna is on that, is that we can at least do it for group actions. So if I have a one ended amenable group with some kind of generating sets, and I look at its prior graph of some free well action, then I can find the one ended spanning tree of this graph. So this thing has a real one ended spanning tree almost everywhere. And I'll mention now that we also prove more general results in the bare measurable context, where I throw out a meager set instead of a null set. We can do it for any one ended graph. We can, if you give me any one ended, I guess, locally finite graph, then I can find the one ended spanning tree of this thing after throwing out a meager set. And if I care about the Borel setting, then for polynomial group group actions, we can find a genuine Borel one ended spanning tree without throwing out any points. Uh, but this is a 30 minute talk, so I won't really talk that much about either of these two results. So I'll focus on those measurable things since that's the most related to what people here care about. Uh, Matt, wait. So you still can't do the free group on acting on its boundary example. Uh, this automatically is just. No, I know, but like, is there any way to put it inside a one ended graph? Like, I guess you maybe want to prove that if you can't put it in a one ended graph, or no, you can probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you might be able to find some other one ended spanning groups. Yeah, so so you, you still haven't dealt with this. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, so I neither know a proof nor a counterexample for the general fact. So for groups, we have a proof. As far as I know, it's still open whether this works in general. Right? This is the question from again the second authority. No, no, right? Not the second author. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm very sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is Jenny's on that. If we want to go with yeah, yeah, yeah. stage. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I guess I'll keep uh doing this case. So anyway, I don't know of any you know direct way of using the fact that we already know how to find spanning trees to build the one ended spanning trees for these group action. So instead of Directly trying to go from a spanning tree to a one ended spanning tree. We'll build these things called connected hosts, which are famously well named objects that no one disagrees with. Anyway, so let's just review what a connected host is. So maybe let me erase some of this and just draw you a picture of the storage. 
So a connected host is a very nice witness to hyperfiniteness that satisfies three properties. So the first property that a connected host needs to fit, well, it's a you know collection of finite sets that will eventually be most likely finite this. And the first property we want this thing to satisfy is that if I give you some edge in my graph, I can eventually find a piece of code that contains that edge. That's all property you want to say. Property two is saying that the pieces of code mustn't touch each other unless they're entirely contained inside each other. So for example, I can't have two pieces of code that share edges like this. This is very bad. These are very modern pieces of code. We don't care. <laughs> Instead, what we want them to have is if they were going to share an edge like this potentially, we want one of them to be entirely inside of the other one. So if they do share an edge, then one contains the other one. That's exactly what property two is saying. And this is the definition of a normal toast that you might be familiar with already. Uh, the final property of a connected toast, the additional property of connectedness, so that if I give you a big piece of toast and a bunch of tiny little pieces of toast, then the once I throw out these pieces of toast, everything else needs to still be connected. So if I have two points that live in this big piece of toast, I need to be able to find some path between them that avoids the little piece. So this is exactly what these three properties say. I'll point out that G has a connected toast almost everywhere, if and only if it has a one-ended span tree almost everywhere. <clears throat> so in the paper with Gadwar and Martin, where we define connected toasts, we use this direction. And we use the fact that we already knew how to find these one-ended span trees to build the toasts. Uh, but the other direction is actually even easier to prove. So maybe let me very quickly skip this. So the only idea for the forward direction of this thing is to start with my connected toast, and I can start drawing spanning trees inside of my pieces of toast. And then I can choose a general from each of my pieces of toast to connect to the outside and kind of point things in this direction. And the connectedness property uh, will tell me that I can keep doing this in some nice connected way. This gives me a finite backwards uh, Three, which is exactly what a one ended tree is. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So if you want to find one ended span trees, our real goal is going to be to find these connected toasts almost everywhere. How are we going to find connected toasts almost everywhere? Well, the way you find normal toast is by thinking about finite highs and cuts. The way we'll find connected toasts is by thinking about connected finite highs and cuts. We'll just add the word connected everywhere and everything will work out. So let me explain what a connected finite has and cut is. So a connected finite has and cut, this is going to be some Borel subset. Uh, S, which is the subset of my group of cuts. So that the induced graph on G minus S has only finite connected components. And moreover, uh, if I look at a single component of my graph, S is connected in that component. Basically, meaning that whatever this X is needs to be some sort of like maybe a fattened up pretty like thing that will start isolating some finite sets. That's more or less what this definition is saying. And again, a couple of the directions of this are easy. So, this is the thing that I've got to um, have a connected source. It can only if I have a connected finite has kind of arbitrarily small measure. Uh, to go from a toast to such a finite ties and cuts. I can just find some level of my toast that contains 99% of the points. Everything outside of this is connected by the definition of being a connected toast. So that's my connected finite as and cuts. The other direction is a tiny bit harder. So if I have some finite ties and cuts, well, I'll want to start plopping them on top of each other to try to build a connected toast. So the first level I can plop down, I've got you know a bunch of finite stats in this, so there's always connected paths outside of these ones. Uh, afterwards, I want to put down another bigger uh, one of these things, minus my finite ties and cuts. And of course, the issue is that I don't want to throw too much out, and I want to preserve my toast properties. So how are we going to do that? Well, given the first uh, cut, I can start writing down some bounds that almost all of these things satisfy. So all but epsilon of my uh, pieces after the first cuts have size at most n. Uh, moreover, so I know that the neighborhood of these people is connected. So maybe I can go very close to witness that the neighborhoods of my pieces are connected. 
but maybe I have some outrageous things where I've got to go super far away to witness the path between these two things. Uh, but I, you know, these are all finite paths. So for again, for all but epsilon of my pieces, there's some finite bound on how far away I need to go to witness this connection. So pieces have size of most and connected boundaries. That is the set of things I need to witness this connection of size of most n. And, and then finally, I can assume that my uh, measure is quasi PMP on this. Namely, I have some full cycle. So I can assume that none of these points are too much heavier than any other points. And then finally, I can pick some new uh, epsilon prime, some new finitizing cuts. I can try to plop it down. So I have the pieces inside of the not cut set in the co cuts, and then maybe epsilon measure, epsilon prime measure of stuff yeah. inside. And the whole point is that, well, most of these things will live inside, most of their connected boundaries will live inside, which starts making me look like a connected toast. But they, you will have stuff or yeah, they will be that that there will be some stuff like this where either I intersect with the toast piece itself. Or maybe I don't intersect with the toast piece, but maybe I do intersect with the boundary of the toast piece that I need to witness connection. But these properties plus this co-cycle thing can tell me that the measure of this is tiny, tiny, so I can throw it out and you know just keep going eventually get my connections. So that's the three sketch of those paths. And um, so like this long path that you drew, you're saying like you won't take those, but we take the shorter ones. Yeah, yeah. so I'm saying that the ones where the shorter paths live entirely in this big piece, I'll take these ones. The ones where the path needed to go outside, I'll throw out this entire piece of toast. But the whole point is that this n plus m, well, this is some finite sets. I can bound how much weight things have. So if one of these things does intersect the boundary, then it's well at most epsilon prime measure of things do that. And what's the weight of stuff I throw out? Well, it's something like epsilon prime times n times n times the like cycle, which is, I can still make as small as I want because epsilon prime is as small as I want. Hmm. And that the fact that cosine cycle may be unbounded it doesn't matter. Yeah, because for every single one of these pieces, well, it's a finite set, so the cosine cycle is bounded on this finite right. set. Yeah. Right for 99% of points, the cycle is bounded by a million or something. So it doesn't lose the issues. Anyway, are we all okay with this? So, again, the plan is to find connected toes to find scanning trees. To do that, we want connected kind of cousin cuts. So, I guess I have about 10 minutes left. So, the final question is how are we going to find these small kind of cousin cuts? And our strategy is going to be to adapt uh, Andrew Marx's group of the Tom Solomon West Theorem. So maybe this is also what the original group did, but I haven't read that one. I've read Marx's group. So I'll assume he did something different than they did. But if I don't care about uh, the connected finite as any cuts, if I just want to find small finite as any cuts that may or may not be connected, what's the strategy for this group going to be? Well, we want to use local information about the group, namely that it has smaller sets. So start proving some local information about the group. First, we prove that it has zero isoparametric constant on any positive subsets. Then we use the isoparametric constant to become so small high in cuts. So the idea is that we want to do that, but again, we want to place the word connected everywhere somehow, and that will fix all of our cuts. So of course, you can't go directly from zero isoparametric constant to small connected finite housing cuts, since we have these two ended examples that you can't possibly adapt to make sense in any meaningful way. So we need some connected version of the isoparameter constants. And to get that, we want some connected version of the polar. So what's the that connected version of the polar going to be? Well, it'll be basically like the usual definition of the polar. But instead of just caring about the boundaries of our sets being small, we'll have these sets few ends that are kind of like fattened up boundaries that are connected, contain my usual boundary, and are still tiny tiny. So the picture to keep in mind is basically this picture. So if I want to be a usual folder set, well, maybe this thing would be my folder sets. The folder condition would say that the neighborhood of this thing, the boundary of this thing is small. It's as small as I want it to be for a good enough folder sets. So the extra info that this special folder has 
is that maybe I can fatten up my boundaries a tiny bit in order to witness the connection. So maybe I can take you know distance 10 around this thing instead of distance one around this thing to find paths that connect up all of my points. So if I have these uh, nice folder sets, then maybe I'll be a little bit happy. And for very nice groups, you can certainly find such nice smaller sets. For example, a polynomial group case works by saying, well, these things are virtually nil potent. If I'm virtually nil potent, then for any set you give me, if it's boundary, if it doesn't have any rules, if it's boundary C is just a single infinite phase, then I can end up by some constant K that doesn't depend on the size of the set to witness the connectivity of the outside boundary. Uh, there are some crazy counterexamples to this for general amenable groups. You can't witness this connected boundary thing with just some single constant around my usual corner sets. I think length letters or something or some like nasty thing that has like infinite or arbitrarily large like isolated points somehow. So that'll lead to problems. So we needed some other way of building these things that's maybe a tiny bit more complicated. And now we're finally at the punchline of I guess it's not. But but finally presented groups are okay. Yeah, finally presented groups are okay. Yeah, the Christian space are finally presented. We only use polynomial because those ones have toast already. So toast plus this k boundary thing is exactly what you need for connected because I get yes. Yeah. But anyway, so again, we want to prove this purely group theoretic thing in order to make some progress on this problem. So of course, naturally, we would really want to do this just using pure group geometry arguments. I don't know how to do that. So, you know, the very natural thing to do to prove this is to look at some PMP action of this thing in a metric space. So if I look at the group gamma that I'm going to prove some detail about, well, I can look at a triangle with some PMP action. Uh, by these results I mentioned before, we already know this thing has a one end of spanning tree. And then we're going to do some probabilistic arguments to try to build these folder sets coming from the one end of standard mm -hmm. tree itself. So if you give me big enough n and n, then the arguments will be that basically any vertex I pick of type n in the tree, we can take that thing to be one of my BNs, and we can take the things at level uh, below it to be my at ends, and that will more or less be it. So maybe let me draw a point picture of it. And let me see how much time. I've got four minutes left, but I think we started three minutes late, so I'll give myself eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> it cease. Right, so the basic idea is that any of these one ended span trees I give you have to kind of look like this, you know, binary tree, or maybe even half the same tree. And in these trees, most of the points live very close to the bottom of my graph. And moreover, these things will already basically satisfy at least a bunch of these conditions. So, for example, if I give you this point up here and say stuff that lives below this in the tree is my BN, well, if I look at uh, my FN is the union of all of the points that live down here, well, inside of the tree, it's certainly the case that my BN minus my FN is connected. The tree is exactly what witnesses this. So, the only thing you have to worry about is that the uh, boundary of my FN sets is contained inside of my BN sets. And to do this, it's not going to be so difficult in general. If I already was a tree, there's nothing else to do. But since I'm not already a tree, it might be the case that some of these things have edges that were cut out of the tree and go up here or something. Uh, that's what we want to avoid. But maybe let me go a little bit quickly to do this. So again, these left and end tiles are saying just look at the levels of my tree, a left and end tiles, everything that lives below that level. And you want to start arguing about which sorts of tiles cover other tiles in the sense that they don't have any bad edges that we want to argue that for some big enough end, maybe end that lives up here, uh, and some end that lives down here, almost all of the points live below this end and are covered by something that lives up here. So that's basically what all of this stuff is saying. So I covered the you cover a set if you contain that such boundary in the original graph. And then if I if you give me an end tile that's so you can come up with a set of things that it covers, which is exactly like a six coin. And inside of this language, one of these nice polar sets that we want to find is exactly something that's epsilon n covering 
and the sun sunlight set K minus the things I cover, uh, the pi that I decided to pay has to be connected. Right, so it's already the case that K minus is the things that covers is connected because it's I'm throwing up stuff that lives low on the tree and keeping stuff that lives high. So I want to find a single epsilon n covering uh, I don't know how to find a single one, but I can find a bunch of them. That's how these probabilistic truths you put together. So the claim is that for any two epsilons that you give me, I can find n and m so that basically everything inside of my graph is covered by epsilon n covering n times. And we're close to being out of time, so I won't step this through uh, in too much detail. But basically, the idea is that Burrell and Kelly said that 99.99% of stuff lives below some level n and is covered by some level n. Right. So, again, if you give me any finite set, then it's covered by some level. So, just using the fact that my measure union is up to what you'd expect it to, I can find n and n so that almost everything lives below n and is covered by some finite set m. And then if I don't, if most of my titles don't satisfy this property, then I get some sort of nasty expansion that contradicts the fact that everything was done. So I maybe won't go into any more details than that. It's a brief set of the proof. You just, if you don't satisfy this thing, then your boundary kind of has at least epsilon times your mass, which is expansion that shouldn't exist in a hyperfinite community graph. And you can just write down these inequalities. So we still have to finish the proof, and I never plan on talking that much about this. So using these very slight special order sets that we just built, the rest of the proof is basically just following along with Andrew Marx's proof of phone solving ways. Uh, but now we have to kind of carry along this information about these beams and these X and stuff like that, so it gets a little bit more. In particular, the definition of, of connected and so parametric function that we need is this really annoying, ugly thing that kind of carries this information about the BX level. So the way we get this thing is exactly following this usual route of getting uh, zero isoparametric constant from usual corner sets, but there's just extra jump you have to carry along throughout the whole proof and it's not so simple. So I maybe won't go into any more details in this and just scare you off from reading this section by flashing this nasty thing like that. So, I guess now we're basically out of time. So I've got one minute left, I suppose. And so I just wanted to ask uh, again, is there some nice way of doing this solar set construction that doesn't use this ESD stuff? That's just an algebraic thing. So there should be some nice way of doing it. And then again, what happens outside of the context of the actions? Can I still find the one end of standing tree? And then the final question is if I do have a Hobel one end of standing tree, just off that way. Can I use this thing to build a connected to this? In the measurable setting, you can just with some Borel can tell you stuff, but what about in the Borel sense? Can you do it there? So that's it. Or fleshing us uh, the arc of building trees and questions. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so what so in the bare setting, do you do we know that every one-ended thing, like any one ended thing has a bare measurable connected to it? Yeah. So yeah, the perk of this is just these usual bare category arguments, right? You can just start building it by hand. I can find my two pieces that are far apart from each other, far enough to witness that they have these connected boundaries. Mm -hmm. And you can just, you know, throw out finitely much stuff, but bare magic says that you don't throw out like anything other than an So, so that proof is not that hard. So do you actually, you know, you said the problem is that you take a spanning subtree of uh, one ended uh, hyperfinite graph mm -hmm. and you might end up with an infinitely ended mm -hmm. uh, subtree. Do you have an example of that? Uh, no. I mean, you just could potentially end up. Yeah, you more. could, but like you don't have an example, example of a problem. I'm not a very example of Person, me neither, but I, I don't like like any example. I hope my students would. <laughs> well, you have felt it though. Same but also, also, I want to point out, yeah, yeah, this the first statement that you proved an existence of special corner sets using major group theory is like right at this, uh, like what this conference is about. Well, I don't know, maybe some like normal. So don't even ask theory. people to prove. No, no, no. Well, they might have just a very simple proof already that doesn't need any difference. Yeah, I think you can use the the Galvin Galvin trickery for a counter example yeah. for this last one. I was thinking that. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not positive about this still. I don't know. I mean, you'd still want a down to degree example, I suppose. But yeah. <laughs> there are no more questions than we build for finger at the other.